Good morning, Grace Church. My name is Timothy, and I serve here as an elder at Grace Church, and it's my joy to worship you together with you this morning. Thank you for joining us in person, for those of you who are here in this room with us, and also for those of you who are joining us online, I want to say welcome. Uh, Grace Church is a gospel-shaped community that leads people to follow Jesus in all of life. And so we like to remind ourselves of this so that when we meet together, we're reminded of the purpose that we're meeting together for, to study the gospel, to preach the gospel, to share the gospel with each other. And then as we do that, we want to be able to lead each other and those who do not yet know Jesus to follow Jesus in all of life. And so that looks like when we meet together on Sunday morning, be being shaped by the gospel, when we go to work tomorrow morning, being shaped by the gospel, and when we are with our friends on Saturday afternoons, being shaped by the gospel, because the gospel is for all of life. And so it's our prayer that as we study together, as we pray together, as we sing together this morning, that we would be shaped by the gospel. Uh, before we begin our service this morning, there's a few announcements. Uh, the first is, if you have ever connected to the Wi-Fi here uh, at SWDA, we'd like to ask that you disconnect so that we have all the bandwidth possible for those of, of you who are joining us via the live stream. Make sure that we get a good signal up to the internet. And the second one is that we would like to encourage you to be involved in the missional communities that we have as part of Grace Church. And if you are not yet part of a missional community, you can go to the website and then click on the button connect with us. And then there, there's a link that says missional communities that gives you the information that you need to know about to be able to join a missional community find the ones that are meeting near you. Um, they're mostly happening on Zoom right now just because of the COVID guidelines, but we would encourage you to take part in a missional community so that we can all connect with one another in a way that's just not possible on a Sunday morning. The second thing that we would like to uh, announce this morning is that along with missional communities, the second aspect of these spaces for community and learning is the Grace Church Institute. Now, last fall, we started introducing this Grace Church Institute by having two classes that would happen on Sunday afternoons after the service. And we're going to be restarting that in February. So that in the first, uh, the first Sunday on February, the first Grace Church Institute Institute class of 2021 will be taking or will be starting. There will be some more information coming out via email, but we encourage you to start thinking about uh, if you would like to be involved in this Grace Church Institute for this year and in February starting this first class. And so those, those are the announcements that we have uh, this morning. They'll also be coming out in email as well. And before we begin this service, I would like to pray for us that we would turn our hearts towards Jesus and focus our hearts on the gospel. So let's, let's pray this morning. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege and the honor and the joy that it is to come to worship you together this morning. We thank you for Grace Church that we can join together in worshiping you, in shaping our lives around the gospel, and being reminded of gospel truths this morning as we meet together, as we sit under the preaching of your word, as we fellowship with one another, as we listen to songs, as we pray in all this, that we would be shaped by the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. And when we come to you, we want to recognize who you are, and we want to dwell on the goodness of God. And so, Father God, we praise you, and we praise you for being kind. You show your kindness towards us, especially in Jesus Christ, that while we were sinners, while we were enemies with you, you sent Jesus in the ultimate kindness to make a way for us to have a right relationship with you. You are kind to us and patient with us, you are kind to us in the way that you are gentle with us. We praise you for being kind in all the ways that you show your kindness towards us. We also praise you for your strength. You are stronger than anything that we can think of or imagine. In your strength, you rule the world. You rule the universe. 
In your ultimate strength, you keep everything in control according to the plans that you have. You are completely strong, stronger than we can imagine, stronger than we can hope to be. And we praise you for your strength, the strength that you display as you rule your kingdom, as you rule the world, as you take uh, sovereign care of human history. And so we praise you for your, your kindness and for your strength. But when we think about who you are and we praise you for these attributes, we also recognize that we are not at all like you. When in your kindness, we also recognize that when we compare ourselves to you, that we are not kind. Too often, even in this last week, we have spoken unkind words. Whether we meant to or we were careless with our words, we have harmed those we love, those we work with, our neighbors and friends, with our careless or unkind words. We are not kind. We are not kind when we prefer ourselves over one another. We are not kind when we uh, cut in front of people or we uh, do not consider one another as more important than ourselves. And so we pray that you would forgive us for not being kind as you call us to be in modeling after what you are. We ask that you would also forgive us for not depending only on you and on your strength. When we think of your strength, we have to confess that we in ourselves want to be strong. And so when we need, uh, when we need help, we turn to ourselves so often instead of turning to you. Forgive us for thinking that we can do what we need, what we can live our lives in our own strength, depending on our own grit and determination to be able to live rightly, to be kind to others. And forgive us, Father God, for depending on our own strength instead of your own. Forgive us in our, our prayerlessness that is evident by us depending on ourselves and not on you. Forgive us for not coming to you in prayer, asking that you would give us the strength, that you would give us the kindness that we need and that we are not capable of apart from you. We also thank you that through Jesus we can be made right with you, that when we confess our sins that you forgive us. We thank you that our old self was crucified with Jesus in order that our body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We thank you that because of Jesus, we are not slaves to sin, but we can be slaves to righteousness and we can live rightly according to the manner that you have called us. We also want to give you thanks this morning. We thank you for being able to meet together and the joy that it is to see brothers and sisters together fellowshipping, sharing the gospel with one another, catching up, encouraging each other, knowing how we can pray for each other. Thank you for this sweet ability to be able to meet together, to encourage one another and spur each other on toward love and good deeds. We also thank you for our hosts, SWDA, and them allowing us to meet here week after week and providing us this space for us to be able to meet. We pray that you would bless them, and as they are here operating in this city, we pray that you would give them uh, uh, success as they have this community space for us to be able to rent. We thank you for our hosts and pray that you would show them your goodness and that they would see that as coming from you. We also want to pr pray in terms of supplication and asking, our, giving our requests to you. We pray this morning that you would give us open hearts, open hearts to hear from your word this morning. Would you convict us of sin? Would you show us the ways that we can obey you? Would you show us ultimately your sovereignty and your sufficiency over everything that after today that we would be able to look back and say we love Jesus more than we did before we heard this sermon, before we met together this morning. Would you encourage us to love Jesus more? 
Pray that you would be with Corey as he preaches for Mark, that you would give him words to say and clarity of thought as he brings us the message this morning. We pray that in the prayers that we pray, in the songs that we listen to, in the psalms that we read, that in all these things Christ would be exalted. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. At this moment, Andy's going to come and read to us from Psalm 73. Good morning. Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. The bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, How can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept utterly swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, when you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Well, good morning, Grace Church. My name's Corey, and I serve as one of the elders here. Thanks so much for joining with us today. If you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 10, that's where we're going to be this morning. We have been in this series in Mark since the beginning of last year, really, and we're now in Mark chapter 10 with our plans to finish our study in the book of Mark uh, with the passage about Christ's resurrection on Resurrection Sunday this year. But today we are in Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 13 through 16. Now, last week we looked at the first set of verses in Mark chapter 10, and we saw Jesus teaching about staying committed to the promises of marriage. And we talked about how it's possible to stay committed to marital promises or to any promise in life because Christ holds fast to us. He says, hold fast to the promises husband and wife in marriage. Hold fast to the promises you make towards God and towards others. But the only reason that's possible is because Christ first holds fast to us. And in light of this topic of marriage commitments, we actually have a wonderful announcement to make today that two of our members, Sam and Tuli, got engaged over the holidays. And so they wanted us to announce that to you today that you could rejoice with them. Yeah. And they would ask that you would just be praying for them as they're in this season of engagement, but moving towards marriage. And Sam, truly, we are thrilled for you. We're excited for you. And I I know that all the church family is rejoicing with you today as well. So as Jesus talked about this idea of promises in marriage, he concludes that section. Today, we move on to the next section of Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. And as I was thinking about this particular section, I actually started thinking about an experience I had with my kids 
I, I titled this message Kingdom Kids because uh, it's very much about children. And as I was thinking about my kids, not long ago, the Lego company opened a store here in Amsterdam near the Dom. Now, I just, I know you online maybe can't see this, but just in the room, how many of you in this room have ever put together a set of Lego something? Anybody? Yeah, lots of hands. Now, if you'd admit this, how many of you have put one of those together at a time when you would say, I wasn't a kid, I was an adult, but you participated in building something to do with Lego? There's plenty of hands up in the room for those of you that can't see at home. And this was very much affirmed by the fact that when I took my kids to the Lego store, there was this line around the block as the store had newly opened, but it wasn't just kids or parents with their kids. There were plenty of adults with no kids at all standing in line at the Lego store. And so this thing that on the surface, Lego, this toy, that you would say, oh, that's about kids, right? It's for kids. It's a kid brand. In one sense, that's right. But in another sense, really, it's for everybody. That's why you saw young and old all lined up outside the Lego store when it opened. When we look at this passage, in just a few short verses, verses 13 through 16 today, we're going to see something that is about kids. But it also goes much deeper than that. And though the immediate context is about children, Jesus teaches us a lesson that's not just for kids, but for every single one of us in this room. So let's look at Mark chapter 10, and we'll read verses 13 through 16 today. It says, And they were bringing children to him, meaning Jesus, that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. I want us to look at three sections here in Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. The first is this, the rejection of children. The rejection of children. As we look at the context of these circumstances in Mark chapter 10, we've seen, again, the crowds have been gathering, right? We saw that last week at the beginning of Mark 10. Jesus goes to a new place, and as it keeps reoccurring, crowds just gather to him. Whether he's intending for this to happen or not, people just find Jesus and they amass around wherever he is, in a house, in the synagogue, wherever he is, crowds are finding Jesus. And Jesus has just been cornered in the last section by the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders, seeking a way to trick Jesus with their questions. Now, this always fails, but they keep trying to do it, trying to put Jesus in what they see as a difficult situation. But now they've left that engagement with the Pharisees, and Jesus and his followers have made it back to the house where they are staying. And the crowds come, and people, specifically parents with kids, are now coming to the house. Now, you can imagine, if you put yourself in this situation, the fatigue and the demands physically that just seem to be growing. Over and over again, Jesus and his followers are in situations that are very physically, emotionally, and mentally taxing. You can just think about when you are constantly, even just with a crowd, how when enough time has passed, you just feel like, I I need some rest. And this just keeps happening to Jesus and his followers over and over and over again. Crowds coming, pressing, pressing, asking questions, wanting things, Pharisees trying to trick him and manipulate him. And now they're finally back to the house, which typically would be a place of rest. And the people just keep coming. And in this passage specifically, there are parents with kids that are mentioned. But we have to ask, why are these parents bringing these kids? When it says that they wanted Jesus to touch them, what does that mean? Well, this happens within a context of blessing. In reading in R. Kent Hughes' commentary on the book of Mark, he says this about this particular passage. It says, this was in keeping with a classic Jewish custom that dated all the way back to the time of Ephraim and Manasseh. It was about blessing. It was all very proper, traditional, and wonderful. Proud parents held out their precious children to Jesus, who took them in his arms where they snuggled close. He placed his hand on their warm little heads and lifting his eyes to heaven, pronounced a blessing. These parents weren't doing anything that was strange or uncommon within their context. It wasn't improper 
for them to be brought to Jesus or to a religious leader and teacher to ask for a blessing on their children. Yet in the context of the current circumstances, this parade of parents was not welcomed by Jesus' disciples. That's when we get to the rebuke from the disciples, the rejection of the children. The disciples do something that I'm sure at the time they thought was the best thing for Jesus. You know they can see in Jesus the physical exhaustion, that he needs rest. If you have ever been around kids for an extended length of time, you know that having lots of kids around, although very lovely, is not usually a time for rest. And the disciples see this parade of parents coming with their children. And again, Hughes in his commentary describes what might have been the perspective of the disciples as they see this line of families forming at the house. They might have been thinking, these were just children. They were of little importance. They could not enter debate or contribute to the cause, even if they did understand about Jesus. So the disciples stopped the flow. Those parents who were stubborn received a rebuke from the disciples, perhaps along the lines of, the master's a busy man. Now, shalom, be on your way and take your stroller with you. Rebuke is a strong word. It's a sharp disproval or criticism. These children and their parents were not gently turned away by the disciples. They were sharply turned away, rejected, being disapproved of. Just their presence was deemed as unacceptable to the disciples. The disciples reject them, but look what Jesus does. Bring us to the second section this morning, the receiving of children. Jesus rebukes the rebuke. When Jesus heard the disciples tell these parents and their children to go away, it says he was indignant. It means he was furious. I was thinking back to, as I was considering the idea of parents and children and looking at this passage, growing up, this, maybe this is a cultural thing, maybe it's a transcendent thing, but if I was in a lot of trouble, my parents would use my middle name. <laughs> it wasn't just Corey come here, it was Corey Douglas O'Grady, you get over here right now. <laughs> it was an elevated level of disapproving of what had just happened. Jesus being indignant, it's this raised level. It's not a casual dissatisfaction. He is furious that the disciples have done what they just did towards these families and these children. But why? And what is revealed by Jesus' words in this passage when he says, no, bring the children to me? What does it affirm about a biblical, God-given view of kids? There's a couple things we can see from this passage and also from all of Scripture. The first is this. It affirms the value of children. The disciples saw the children as not being worthy of Jesus' time. In some sense, they were deemed not valuable enough to warrant Jesus' attention. Jesus clearly rejects this idea. But why is it that children have value? And we see this as we look at all of Scripture. Children have value, as do all people, because of whose image they are created in. Not what they offer now, and not what they could potentially offer in the future. We look back in Genesis chapter 1, as God is creating all things. It says that God created man, mankind, humanity, in his image. We bear the image of God as his human creation. And because we are image bearers of him and he has stamped his image on us, that alone makes us valuable. Not because of who we are in and of ourselves, we are given value by the one who has created us. That's children, that's adults, that's anyone. Because we are made in the image and likeness of our good, right, and perfect God. That's why children have value, not because of what they offer, because of the God who created them. Even though sin may distort, mar, or at times cover this image, it's still there. It's not gone. I was doing some reading from Martin Luther on this particular subject, and if you know much about Luther, you know he is very strong on sin. He does not 
hold back when it comes to the damage that sin causes. And he even said, although in our sin, the image of God at times can seem as if it's, if it's, if it's gone, he said, it's always still there. Even in the smallest part, it's still there. And because we are made in God's image, that gives both children value and value to all people. I was thinking about this article I read not long ago that actually in 2018, there was this massive mural that was discovered here in Amsterdam by a famous artist. And it was, had been painted on the side of a building. It was actually a storage building that the Stedelijk Museum uses. And this artist wanted to do a huge mural and they thought, well, this is a good place for him to do it. And so he painted this mural, but then after the exhibit was over, they started doing things to the building and they covered up the mural. It's extremely valuable because of who painted it. But they covered it up as they were doing things to this storage building. And so you couldn't see it, but it was still there. And in 2018, they pulled back the things that were covering up the mural and there it was. The wall had always had value, even when the image was covered up. But when it was uncovered, they saw this is the true value of this, this wall. It's not just a wall. It's a masterwork of art. As image bearers, even when sin covers what should be gloriously seen and revealed through us, we do not lose the fact that we are valuable because of whose imprint has been painted on us and in us. That's why children have value. Not because of what they offer now or what they might offer in the future, because of whose image they are made in and who their creator is. By Jesus welcoming these children, he's affirming, I have time and attention for them because these children have value, not because of who they are, but because of whose image they're made in. There's a second thing this affirms in this passage. It affirms the spiritual nature of children. Jesus wanted these kids to come that he might pray a blessing over them. This is because children, as are all people, are spiritual beings. We have an inner person. We have our inner self and our outer self. This spirit, this inner self, is in need of the divine. It's in need because in and of ourselves, our inner self is sinful, broken, and insufficient. That's for kids and adults alike. Jesus desires his spirit to bless the spirit of these children. This should be a reminder to us of the importance of pointing children and their heart towards Christ because they, like us, desperately need it. For as precious and valued as children are, they too are sinners in need of Jesus. But that brings us now to the third part of our section or our passage today, and that's the kingdom of children. The kingdom of children. We've seen in this historical interaction, this real-life event that happened of the children and their parents coming, the disciples rebuking them, Jesus saying, no, I want to receive them. We've seen what this affirms from Jesus, and as we look at all of Scripture, but then Jesus goes deeper than just the context of blessing these children in that particular moment. He now says to those that are listening, that everyone must receive the kingdom, his kingdom, like a child. Jesus gives us a very important lesson. He says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter, shall not enter it. Remember Jesus' teaching? There's three themes all throughout Mark and the Gospels, repentance, belief, and the kingdom. Jesus is saying, if you want to enter into my kingdom, you have to enter it like a child or you don't enter it at all. And Jesus wants to teach about this in the context of this interaction with children. It is about receiving and blessing these kids in that moment, but it's also about more than that. So what does it mean to receive the kingdom? What does it mean to receive Jesus' kingdom and his kingship like a child? I want us to think about the children in this situation. How do they come to Jesus? Let's look at it from two different angles. The first is, what do the kids not bring with them as they come to Jesus? They don't bring any power with them. 
They don't bring any prestige. They don't bring any wealth with them. They don't bring genius thoughts to add to this intellectual or spiritual debate. They don't really bring any personal contribution of any kind. What do they bring? Again, if you've ever been around a group of kids, I'll say for more than about 15 minutes, here's what kids typically say. You're going to hear a few things. You're going to hear, I'm hungry, do you have a snack? You're going to hear, I have to go to the bathroom. And you're going to hear, can you help me with, and there's lots of things that are filled into that blank. Children, you know what they come with? Their need. That's what they bring. Their need. So how does that apply to those who enter into Jesus' kingdom? If you want to enter into his kingdom, you have to know that you come with nothing but need. Jonathan Edwards once said, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. You have to know and admit that you bring nothing of value that merits the attention, love, forgiveness, grace, and blessing of Jesus. You bring nothing except for the need for grace that your sin created. So how is it that you get brought into this kingdom? Well, it's because God desires you to be there and Jesus brings you to himself. As he brings us to himself, we admit and call out in all of our sinful need. And you know what he does? He gives us the greatest blessing the blessing of eternal life through his grace. How did these children get to Jesus? He called for them to come to him. And they came with all their need. Sometimes in these situations in the Bible, because we don't have much uh, detailed description, we gloss over it as if this wasn't like a noisy situation where kids are doing normal kid things. Kids are kids. Kids. And this situation, they came as all kids do, not offering anything of merit to Jesus, but just coming in their kidness, bringing their need. And what did Jesus do? He blessed them. Why? Because he wanted to. Not because they had anything to offer in return. If you are here today and do not yet know Jesus, I pray that he is calling you to himself today. Come with all of your sinful need for your need is all you have. He will not cast you away. He will welcome you into his kingdom, into his family, through the blessing of his atoning death and powerful resurrection being applied to you. This is such good news for us that we can come like children with all of our need because in reality, that's all we have. Jesus says, good, that's the only way you can enter into my kingdom anyway by coming with all of your need, knowing that I will not cast you out, but I will bless you with the greatest blessing, the blessing of grace that comes through my death and resurrection. Why? Because I simply want to love you. I want us to think about three concluding thoughts today. The first is this. In being like our God, the church should value and welcome children. There are sometimes ideas, whether to be explicit or not so much, that we hear within culture today that I want to kind of reject as it comes to what we understand about Jesus and his teaching about children here and also throughout Scripture. Children are not problems to be solved so adults can get on with adulting. They're not, oh, there's kids, what do we do with them so that we can do what we want and need to do? Children are not hindrances to adults' careers or goals or aspirations. Children are image bearers of God. And specifically, I'll say to you today that if you have children in your home, I want to remind you of a wonderful truth from Bible teacher Jen Wilkin. She says this, children are some of your closest neighbors. The two greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you have kids in your home, kids are some of your closest neighbors. They're not an obstacle to be overcome, a a challenge to figure out. They are an opportunity to love them as God has loved you. The second thing I want us to think on today is this. 
Grace Church should be concerned with the spiritual life of children. You may say, I don't have physical children of my own. Maybe you will never have children of your own. But as a member of Grace Church, we still have a spiritual parental obligation to the children that are in this church family. One of our values is that church should be like family. We are a family, and this Grace Church family has children in it. In it. Family, we have to care well for the spiritual well-being and the lives of the kids that are in this family. I'm just going to be honest with you. As one of your elders today, do you know what one of the hardest ministries is to get people to serve in? Kids. <laughs> I think part of that is when you invest in kids and even ministry towards kids, you often give in that moment far more than you get back. And that's okay. Let that be a reminder of how much our God contributed toward us when we gave nothing back. Church, I, I'm going to call you to look for opportunities in all sorts of ways to care for, serve, and be part of the lives of the children that are in this spiritual family. Lastly today, I want us to think on this idea. Let the dependence of children encourage growth in our dependence on God. Let the dependence of children encourage growth in our dependence on God. When you hear children, whether it's babies that are just crying or kids calling out in some kind of need, be reminded of our constant need to cry out to God. When children laugh loudly, be reminded of the joy we can have when we depend on and rest in Christ. When kids run and run and run after being repeatedly told not to, be reminded how often our own hearts want to run from God, how patient he is towards us. When children say, I love you, may it grow a deeper love for us towards God who has given us everything in Christ when we had absolutely nothing to give him back. Remember Jesus' words, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Let your interaction with all children, even specifically the children in this church family, encourage us to grow in our dependence on God because all of us, our spiritual children that desperately, desperately need him. This morning, I want to invite Lisa to come up and pray for us today. Each week after the sermon, we have one of our members pray for us in light of what we've heard from God's word. So I invite Lisa to come and pray for us at this time. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, thank you for your love and care for us in giving us your written word. Thank you for the privilege to hear and receive your word and apply them in our lives. Your word is our spiritual food which draws us closer to you and teaches us how to live out our Christian life for your glory and for our joy. Thank you for your teachings on Kingdom Kids this morning. It's a reminder that children are special blessings from the Lord. They are rich treasures from, the, from God. Thank you, Jesus, for receiving children into your loving arms and blessing them. What a beautiful model of how we are to regard and love our children. Thank you for reminding us that we are to have a childlike, untainted faith to enter into your kingdom. Like children, we are helpless and unable to save ourselves. We must depend totally on your grace and mercy for our salvation, for we are saved by God's grace through faith alone. Salvation is indeed the gift of God. Thank you for your teaching through the examples of children. As the children live by faith, and by faith they accept their status, 
trusting others to care for them and grow to maturity. May we be people who depend on you fully to lead and guide us to a closer fellowship with you and grow to a spiritual maturity. May our fully God-dependent faith be pleasing to you. Help us to be a church that values children and welcomes them into God's family, nurturing them with God's love, teaching them the truth of who you are and your words, and helping them to grow in the grace and knowledge of our wonderful God. Thank you for being faithful Father who loves and cares for us and provides for our daily needs. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, as I was thinking about this passage and about our time of response, even at the communion table today, I was thinking about, in the physical sense, when you look at children, we know that when certain foundational physical needs of kids aren't met, that it often affects how they look at and interact with everything else around them. Right? If kids don't have a place to live or food to eat or a stable environment, that very much affects how they look at and interact with the things and the people that are around them. But I was thinking about how that pertains to us as children of God and that our greatest need in Christ has been met. When we come to this table and think on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can know, children, our greatest need has been met and that is never going to change. And that should dramatically affect how we look at and interact with everything else in life. When other things we desire to happen or to pursue don't pan out the way that we would want them to, we should react and interact with those things differently. Why? Because our greatest need has been met. We go back to this and know this is sure. This is stable. Not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is and what he's done towards us. We bring him our greatest need and he says, I can meet that. And I have. And that need will never be unmet, child of God. It will always be safe and stable and sure. If you are in a season, as many are right now, where there are physical circumstances around you that just seem very unsure, come rest knowing that your greatest need has been met. Not just your need for today or for this year or for this life, but your greatest eternal need is met in Jesus Christ. Rest in that. Find hope in that. Find strength and endurance in that. That in Christ and Christ alone, Christian, our need has been met. We invite you during this time to have a time of response. In a moment after I pray, our musicians will come, and I invite you as they play and sing to listen to the songs that they are playing and singing, to meditate on the truth that we hear in song. Christian, as you are ready, feel free to come to the communion table during these two songs and remember what it is that Christ has done to meet your need. When you go back to your seat, take time to pray and reflect on the truth we've heard from God's word. Look at what is the spirit stirring up in your heart in regards to what we've heard today from God's word. If you desire to stand and raise your hands as, as you listen to the singing, do that. If you want to sit in your seat and pray, do that. If you want to look at God's word, do that. But let this be a time of response together as we hear singing, pray, and as Christians come to the communion table together. Father, I pray right now that all of us who are your children will always see ourselves as that. That we will see ourselves as your children who desperately need you always. Father, we didn't just need you at our moment of salvation. We need you every moment of every day. But thank you that in our need, we can look back at the work of your son, Jesus Christ, and know our greatest need is met. 
Father, I thank you that you are with us. Just as Jesus held close these children, we thank you that if we are your children, that your spirit indwells us and is with us. Father, I thank you so much, as Timothy mentioned earlier in his prayer, for your loving kindness towards us. Father, we as children brought nothing of value, but we weren't just neutral. We actually had sin and rebellion. And yet you chose to love us in Christ anyway. Thank you that we can rejoice and remember that as we come to the communion table today. Father, I also want to pray for the children that are in this church family. I pray that all of us can act as spiritual parents towards them, pointing out that their greatest need is Jesus Christ. Father, may we be truly a family together for your glory and for our good. I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. The crown of thorns set on the king who lives to breathe in agony. Come, O sinner, come and see what our God became to set us free. Come, O sinner, come and mourn for he calls your sin. His own. Do you feel the weight of justice, son? He suffers the rod that you deserve. Come, O oh sinner, come and mourn, for he bears the curse that all you've done. awesome scene where a Savior bleeds Oh, the power of the love of God come and stand me Sinner, come rejoice. 
mercy fills this place of scorn for he dies to save his enemy that all who draw near may know his peace come O sinner come rejoice to the death of christ that is destroyed oh the wonder of this awesome scene where a savior Stay. 
Father, we thank you that as your children, our assurance always and fully is in who you are. Thank you that because it's in you, we can be assured you are our unchanging, good, right, and perfect God who has met our greatest need through your son, Jesus Christ, and who blesses us abundantly day after day. We thank you for the joy that it is to be your children. May we walk worthy of the family that you have called us into. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our benediction verses this morning are from 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 through chapter 3, verse 2, which read, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, that you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it does not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. We are God's children, and he is our good father, and we thank God for the lesson that Jesus can teach us through children about what it means to follow him in all of life. Thank you for worshiping with us together this morning. We look forward to seeing you again soon. In group B, we look forward to seeing you in person next week. Thank you for being here. We pray that you would go in the grace and peace of Jesus. Amen.